I also got some great responses on our on our podcast. Um, people people love yeah. the the deep dive, and um, yeah. But by, by the way, I also wanted to include a little bit of context. We originally met like uh, three or four years ago. I was uh, just a big fan of your content, and I asked you to come on my show at the time mm. called Big Ideas, and uh, we did an yeah. interview. What we should release it on the speed at some point too for posterity, and then. Um, also, I remember you, you were still in school at the time and was. I was like, man, was you gotta, really different. yeah, I was like, you got to go full time. I mean, you were already thinking about it, but I was like, man, yeah. just encouraging you, you got to go full time on this. You, you've got some, something special and, uh, and you did, and you mm -hmm. made, uh, you know, what we'll this to sort of an amazing media property and, uh, the rest is history. You're too kind. Um, is this being recorded right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I was I was wondering why you were saying that to the audience because um, <laughs> I both I know the backstory here. Um, so yeah. <laughs> when I said is this recorded, I want the audience to know this is a profound mind fuck in which I want to create a layer layer of authenticity on top of the video um, so that it feels as if this is entirely candid. The audience should know that, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, we're we're here today to talk about the the Vikings, which I know next to yeah. nothing about. So I'm it's uh, one of I'm my favorite in their history. That. And I brought a Viking longsword with me. Um, <laughs> and amazing. This was actually the topic that got me into history when I was a kid, and it's just I find it really cool. It's one of the historic periods that you really see the extremities of the human character in it, where. We often think human history is just people farming or having kids. And to be honest, that is 90% of the human condition of people just living their lives. And if when someone writes their autobiography, they're not, they're not writing about cooking food or being on the toilet or doing their taxes. But there are periods in human history in which insane things happen. And then those theory periods exist to show that life has meaning and that life is a fabulous, beautiful place. And the thing with the Vikings is that it's a time period. It's the apex of the YOLO. And early America is another apex of the YOLO. And I think that, that those are, that's why those are my two favorite periods of history. Because they're time periods in which people just thought, I'm going to do this. I might die. I'm still going to do this. And let's start with why the Vikings were founded, and what factors brought them together. And I think it's a confluence of three or four different factors. The first is that this was, the Vikings, for those who don't know, it started around 800, a little bit before that, and it ended uh, around 1060. So we're talking about a 250-year time period. And this all occurred during the Dark Ages, and the Dark Ages have become kind of a controversial term among some historians who don't like them, and this is my favorite year of history. And what I'll say is that what people say about the Dark Ages is both true and untrue, where most people, when they think of it, they think of some period of just immense squalor and poverty and that sort of thing. And the true part of that is that after the fall of Rome, so the Dark Ages are roughly the Roman Empire fell in 450. And most people just conflate the Dark Ages with the Middle Ages, where people think that the Renaissance ended the Dark Age. And the Renaissance is in the 1400s when people discovered all the old Greco-Roman stuff. In reality, the Dark Ages is the 500-year period between, let's say, 400 and 1000 AD. And after 1000 AD, European civilization started to... Uh, just get really bigger and more powerful and more technologically advanced. And the thing people don't know at the Middle Ages, which is a thousand AD, all these terms are kind of interchangeable. So you can use the Middle Ages to mean fall of Rome in 400 to Columbus discovering the new world in 1500. You could, I, the way I'm going to use this is the Dark Ages is the period from 400 to a thousand. A thousand to 1500 is the Middle Ages. And the mid, the Middle Ages was the most advanced society up to its point in history, barring China at the same time, where medieval Europe had universities, it had stock markets, it had, they had a really advanced understanding of physics. Medieval Europe invented the scientific method. They 
had a tremendous amount of agricultural advances. They were pretty mechanically advanced where they had clocks and stuff. They had very advanced steel manufacturing. So we think also a lot of the things we think of the Middle Ages are really about the early modern period after. So which, for most of medieval history up to the Black Death, witches were seen as unscientific. And the Catholic Church just said witches don't exist. It, it's pseudoscience. Um, and I'm using these terms apocryphally because what the church said was the science for that society. Or bathing was a huge part of the culture. The Vikings had a rule where they bathed once a week. And bathing stopped being a big thing in the early modern period. So, and the Middle Ages was a lot, it was a lot less religiously fanatical than the early modern period, where you had, there was a lot of atheism in the Middle Ages, as an example, where in all the Italian universities in um, the middle of the 13th, 14th century were run by atheists. It was a big um, political controversy at the time that why are atheists running the universities? And I know this is a long tangent to actually get to the Vikings, but the reason I'm doing this is that most people know nothing about this era, era and it's my favorite. And so the Vikings are ending right when Europe took off in around 1000 AD in the Middle Ages. So the Vikings are at the end of the Dark Age. And the Dark Age was a period in which Western Europe had basically no cities. The only people who could read and write were the church. And um, there was no centralized government. The government was the king would literally walk around the empire and then give orders as he walked around the empire. So in a couple ways, this is a profoundly primitive society. and. Although in other ways, the Dark Ages aren't what people think. This peasants and normal people were taller and wealthier in the Dark Ages than either the Romans before or the Middle Ages after. Where if you look at height and dental health and that sort of thing, because the government was so weak, normal people were wealthier. And so there was more freedom in the society as well. And it, things did better on a local basis and on a civilizational basis it decayed. And to loop this point back, a reason the Vikings started was that around 800, Western Europe was pretty wealthy. It wasn't as wealthy as it would be under the Romans before or the Middle Ages after, but there was a lot of money circulating around because the Frankish Empire, which is Charlemagne's empire, after the Roman Empire fell, the Franks were a tribal group who unified all of Western Europe. So they had all of France, parts of Spain, Germany, the Low Countries, Italy, all in a single empire. And then this empire became wealthy and unified. And then this created an incentive for the Vikings from Scandinavia to raid it. And the Vikings were tribal. Scandinavia wasn't a unified country. It was tribal. It was didn't have Christianity. It worshipped the old gods. Um, and these tribes could... Um, sail very well. So the tribes looked at the Western Europe, so the, the Frankish Empire, and you have England. And Ireland was also tribes, but the tribes were pretty literate. Ireland was actually the, the most advanced place in, intellectually in, in Europe at the time, or Western Europe, even though Ireland was a tribal society. And so you had this, Western Europe had money, and also Western Europe was at a political crux in which Charlemagne the empire of that time period run by Charlemagne was it was held together by his single charisma. And so for the hundred years before Charlemagne, the Frankish Empire conquered all of Western Europe except Britain because it had the best leaders. But there was no bureaucracy. There was no systematizing. And because of that, the empire was fragile. So it was pretty easy to attack the empire at its margins and take the money. And all of Western Europe at this point was experiencing overpopulation. And this created a dual-sided thing where Scandinavia, where the Vikings lived, they had lots of young men who needed to attack outwards because it was overpopulated. Meanwhile, the overpopulation made the states of Western Europe weaker because there weren't, wasn't enough stuff to go around. And what happened after the death of Charlemagne was that Western Europe collapsed into anarchy. And through the anarchy and a lot of wealth, it created a strong incentive for the Vikings to basically predate upon the society. I know that took me forever to explain, but do you have any questions? Yes, a bunch. So why did the Dark Ages start or happen? Rome fell, where um, 
in my opinion, Rome is really whitewashed by our society. It had a lot of issues, but the Romans did create this giant um, advanced empire that stretched from England to Arabia. And the Romans brought peace. They were a pretty technologically advanced society. And so they established this level of stability and order, which created a very advanced society. The problem is that the Roman Empire got so safe that it kind of rotted on the inside because there was no incentive to keep the institutions that kept the empire going. And because of that, the Romans lost the ability over time to do the thing that their ancestors did. They didn't know how to build the old buildings. They didn't know. They, had, they lost their intellectual life. They lost their ability to raise taxes or use a military. And so due to decadence, the Roman Empire wore itself out. And then the empire fell apart. The, the Roman Empire fell apart because its internal culture got destroyed, not because um, not because barbarians destroyed the empire, but the society was already dead. And th then what happened was that you basically had to restart, where the Romans, Roman civilization was no longer effective. And so you had to do a total restart. And out of the ashes of the Roman Empire came Islam, Orthodox Greek civilization in the West. And so all the foundations of modern Western civilization stem from the Dark Ages because you had to recreate civilization where individualism came from the Dark Ages. Um, the, our modern moral code, the guilt-based Western moral code, came from the Dark Ages. Christianity came from the Dark Ages. Um, modern parliament came from the Dark Ages. And so the Dark Ages was this very backwards period, but in it came the seeds of our current society. Got it. So the sort of rotting from the inside, have there, yeah. uh, has there been other empires that have fallen in that way? Slash, could you oh, imagine totally. that? Happened? Yes. Yeah. So this is something, um, there's a historical theorist named Spengler who's gone through this and every civilization rises and falls. And the interesting thing with the fall of Rome in the dark ages is that the same process occurred in China at the exact same time, China and Europe, had barbarian invasions in dark ages at the exact same time. Um, India also, India went through a dark age a couple hundred years before. There was a dark age, um, a really big one, 3,000 years ago. And so that's when Moses was. The reason Moses could bring the Jews to Israel was because it was in the middle of a dark age, so no one had the military. Israel was part of the Egyptian empire because of the dark age, it was just all these little city-states. So there's a natural rhythm between dark ages and golden ages that you see going back for thousands of years. How about where we are now? Is this something you, you could potentially wor worry about society given sort of the advance of technology and our inability to understand how it, uh, how it works on an individual level? Or do you think there's, you know, no, I think it's unlikely. plausible. I think we could have a dark age now. I think we're seeing collapses in statistics in almost every form of civilization. Um, the question, though, is that do we have a dark age now or do we have one in 400 years? Because um, from the civilizational cycles I study, we would start to go into decline now, but we would go for another 400 years before another dark age. And that's basically above my pay grade. I don't know. It could happen. Um, but we're all we're still a very advanced very intelligent society and so it's i wouldn't put it as my top 5 worries right now yeah the um so the dark ages that happened well i, I can't resist that layup what, what are your top 5 worries yeah, right sure. now <laughs> right well i i can't resist uh not not following that thread what, what are your your yeah. big worries now oh um I mean, you guys should watch my channel. Uh, my biggest worries, yes. uh, let me actually, uh, Eric, let me send you the video that I just made on what if all test. I'll send it to you after you can watch it. It's on Mouse Utopia, where Amazing. Mouse Utopia, you know about it? Um, no, I don't. So my top worry is Mouse Utopia now, and that was an experiment that happened uh, in the 60s, where they put nine mice into a pen, and they gave the mice infinite food and perfect conditions. The mouse population skyrocketed, and the cage could fit 6,000 mice. There were only 2,000. Um, so the mouse population got to 2,000, and their society completely collapsed, where 
female mice became very masculine and they stopped raising raising the children well, which created a generation of autistic children mice. Um, then male mice became effeminate. There was a social class of male mice that would just groom themselves all day. They wouldn't act in society or behave. Some mice became adrenaline junkies who would just obsessed with social approval. Other mice turned into violent sociopaths. And what happened was that the mouse society completely collapsed and they stopped having children. The birth rate fell apart. And this is the video I finished and I'm, I hope to release it today or tomorrow. Um, so that's my biggest worry. Um, I think, and because I see everything that's happening in mouse utopia could happen. It's happening right now. Just look outside. And the thing that makes me scared of mouse utopia is it is very similar to the fall of Rome. If you look at the things that kill civilizations, like the fall of Rome, the fall of the Han Chinese, the fall of the Mayans, it's all very similar to Mouse Utopia, which is um, birth rates collapse, people lo the society loses values, a convergence between the sexes, so men become more less me less masculine, women become less feminine. Um, you see rises in sociopathy. Basically, everything you see in civilizational collapse is the same as in Mouse Utopia. It's just Mouse Utopia is on steroids. And I think when societies get too wealthy and safe, decadence happens. And decadence is what I described. So civilizations rot. And Mouse Utopia is just decadence plus. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. The um, Okay. So going back to the Dark Ages, um, to this, so Dark Ages, 500 years, that's like, yeah. um, you know, one fourth. Or 600, time really. It's like, it's like 400 or 400 or 500 to 1000 AD. And it was a period in which Western Europe had no cities. It was barely literate. The Catholic Church was the entire cultural life. And we don't give the Catholic Church credit for just keeping Western civilization alive. And um, so it was a profoundly religious society. And the thing is, this was the golden age for the Muslim world. During the European Dark Ages, in Islam and in China, this was their best periods ever. But in Western Europe, this was a period in which civilization just collapsed. Yeah. Wow. And the, so is this a multipolar world during the Dark Ages? I don't know if that's a good way of putting it, because... There were four big civil there were five big civilizations in Eurasia. You had the West, um, who was based around the Frankish Empire, which owned all of Western Europe except Britain, and England and the British Isles had their own kingdoms. You had Islam, um, you had the Eastern Roman Empire, which kept going, and they were based out of the Balkans and Turkey. You had India, and India was they were doing really well, and China. And so each of these civilizations were in their own world where they were so far apart, they couldn't really fight each other. And so each civilization had its own, except for the Muslims fought the Christians in Europe. They were constantly at war. And the Muslims owned the entire Mediterranean. So Europe was stuck in Europe while the Muslims owned all the trade in the Mediterranean. Um, and... What happened was that this was the golden age of the Silk Road as well, where the Chinese would trade with the Muslims, who would trade with the Indians, who would trade with Europe. And so you had all of these self-contained civilizations that weren't really multipolar because they weren't competing with each other. It was like a bunch of um, a bunch of different independent worlds strung together by a series of strings. Yeah, fascinating. And so what, what, what got us out of the Dark Ages? That's a great, we'll get back to this by the end of the Vikings, where the thing that oh, got good. us out of the Dark Ages is uh, the same thing that ended the Viking Age, where it's a combination of a bunch of things, where first of all, agriculture improved tremendously, where there was a breakthrough in plow types, where in the older plows, Northern Europe was just marginal. The way to imagine it is imagine if we had a new agricultural innovation that suddenly made Alaska incredibly fertile. So Alaska goes from being irrelevant to an incredibly populous area. And so with that new style of plow around 1000 AD, France became, France's population tripled, Germany's population tripled. And so that, that was a real, that was factor one. Factor two is you invented you invented feudalism because in the era of the Vikings, most peasants were free, which is 
good. The problem, though, is the peasants couldn't protect themselves. So as a reaction to the Vikings, Europe started developing these deals where a lord would have a private military force of knights, and the knights would fight off invaders like the Vikings, the Arabs, the Hungarians. This was the worst time for Europe. Europe in the round 850 was being attacked on three sides from the Muslims from North Africa and the Mediterranean, the Vikings from Scandinavia, and the Hungarians from Hungary. And so feudalism developed to fight off those three invaders. And with the knights and the nobility, you, Europe was suddenly protected. And feudalism gets a lot of crap today, and I think that's justified in some ways. But it was an incredibly effective system which kept Europe safe. And Europe, before it developed feudal or Western civilization, before it developed feudalism, was constantly and being attacked. Find feudalism for the audience. Oh, sorry. Feudalism is what happens when the you have a group of peasants. The peasants can't protect themselves. They hire knights to protect themselves. So what happens is the knight becomes the land lord, and then in exchange for their rent, he protects them. And it over time became an, an incredibly extractive system, but it wasn't as extractive in the beginning. Um, and and so it's imagine a village hires. Imagine it's Mad Max. The apocalypse happens in America. Yeah. Towns hire private security to protect them. The private security becomes the government. Yep. And with feudalism evolved into a very extractive system, but one of the benefits for it is Western civilization was incredibly weak during this time period. But then through that, it was capable of expanding. So you saw um, Western civilization conquer back Spain from the Muslims. You saw, it, um, you saw it conquer Scandinavia, go to Poland, Hungary, Eastern Europe. And so modern Europe formed in this time period as a reaction to fighting off invaders like the Vikings. And during before the Vikings, the only areas of Western civilization were Italy, France, the British Isles, little parts of Spain, and Italy. So it was Western civilization was concentrated in this tiny area of Western Europe. Yeah, f fascinating. Okay, so let's let's get into the Vikings. How, how did yes. they emerge? What, what made them so fascinating? Let, let's get into yeah. it. The Vikings uh, are from Scandinavia. So Denmark, Sweden, Norway. Not Finland. Finland Finland is ethnically really different from the rest of Scandinavia. Um, and those three types of Nordic nations did vastly different things as Vikings based off where what their economic position was. So for the Danes, they attacked England in the north of France. I'm going to have a map for this for the YouTube version. The Norwegians went over to Scotland and Ireland and then to Iceland, Greenland, North America. And the Swedes went east to Russia, um, the Eastern Roman Empire down in Turkey and Greece, and then out to Central Asia. So these different axes of Vikings went into different geographic areas. And there wasn't a concept that these were nations at the time. They were all Norse people, where we actually see a lot of precedents. The values, American values of freedom and democracy come from Viking peoples. That's something we don't think about. We think they come from the Greeks and the Romans. But what actually happened was that, as I said before, Roman civilization eroded itself. So by the time the Roman Empire fell, it was this socialist, incredibly authoritarian um, theocracy. It, Rome, when it fell, was almost a communist country with the state ran the entire economy. The Vikings had a social code where most Vikings were democracies, actually, which is something we don't think about, where they had parliaments called all things. and. The Vikings had some of the purest democracies in history, where in Iceland, as an example, the all thing, the way it governed was all Icelanders. And Iceland is much like America, where Iceland was unpopulated, except for a couple Irish monks who had sailed there and they'd meditate there. And so Norwegian settlers took um, Scottish and Irish slave brides, basically, and settled in Iceland. Um, and... Then they settled there because Scandinavia was in a process of political unification during the Viking period. And a big spur for the Vikings was that as Scandinavia was politically unifying, and the way that worked was one tribal warlord basically said, I'm going to conquer everyone else and declare myself king. 
And so these wars of unification spurred the Vikings because you need money to pay off your men to fight other tribes. And if you lose the civil war, go to Scotland, form a kingdom there. So as the Scandinavian kingdoms unified into Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, it created this just spiral of political violence, which spilled over into everything next to Scandinavia. And so Iceland was founded by people who were trying to flee the tyrannical king of Norway, much like America, where the early Americans immigrated there to escape the, the governments back in Europe. And so Iceland was the freest society in history. There were Every year, there was no government, no bureaucracy, no king. Everyone would meet up in the valley of the all thing every summer. They would read the laws out. And so if you broke one of the laws, all your neighbors had a legal right to kill you and steal your stuff. And everyone, you would voluntarily sign up to your, a local chieftain, and the chieftain would protect you. And so Iceland was – in every the way their governance system was, was everyone would vote at the all thing. And so – Iceland is the most libertarian society in history. What then happened is it fell into horrifying civil wars. They killed each other, and then Norway made it a colony. And that's something you see with the Vikings, where the Vikings were democracies. But what would happen is there were, in each Viking village, there were a couple noble families, and people would vote on which of those noble families should run the society. And another big spur for the Vikings was that the way a nobleman would get elected chieftain was through getting money. So he'd go to England, steal from the English, bring it back to Denmark, bribe everyone, then they'd elect him chieftain. And the Vikings had a social structure very similar to tech startups and venture capital, where the way it worked is... I am Rudyard's actually a pretty Viking name. It's Anglo-Saxon. I'm Rudyard Thoraldson. It's funny, Eric Torenberg, you have the most Nordic name in history. I don't think you're <laughs> Scandinavian. Um, so I'm Rudyard Thorvaldson, and I'd like to get I'm bored. I'm in Denmark. I'm the second son of a chieftain, so I'm not gonna inherit anything. I I say my buddies, I say Eric Torenberg, hey, let's rent a boat, go to England, steal from the English and then return to Denmark wealthy, or we can conquer part of England and become kings. So these Vikings would voluntarily gather together in these war bands like startups for the potential to basically steal. Um, and the origins of European capitalism actually stem from this time period and the Vikings. So the reason the, the startup system is so similar to the Viking war band is because it actually came from the Viking war band. Wow. That's fascinating. Thanks. Why, why did they have all the civil wars? Um, this was a pre-bureaucracy society. And so those who, those who watch my content know that I love bureaucracy, but it does have some good things attached to it. And so because this is the Dark Age and almost no one could read and there weren't cities or government – Governance was incredibly decentralized, which is what I'm saying with these local elections. Um, and because government was so decentralized, you needed – government happened when there was an incredibly capable and charismatic leader who could basically get everyone to unify around him. The problem is those leaders are not common. And so what happened over this time period was um, the Frankish Empire, which ruled all of Western Europe except Britain, as I've said five times – they had several incredibly capable leaders in a row. Then once those capable leaders stopped, the empire completely fell apart. So France was France and Germany when were in anarchy for 200 years. And so the Vikings could attack France and England due to that anarchy. Um, England is the same. Where England was five different countries, you had Mercia, Wessex, East Anglia, Northumbria. And because of the decentralization, there was constant war and conflict between everyone, and Scandinavia wasn't unified. And the positive side of this is that it was a society with incredible freedom and social mobility. The negative side of it is chaos. And so after the 200 years of violence around the Viking Age, the Europeans basically said, I am going to surrender my freedom if I stop dying. And so you saw all these monarchies form around Europe, like Europe Europe's countries were actually really created as a reaction to the Vikings. So England, the Vikings conquered two-thirds of England, the one-third that survived Wessex, 
they survived. Then they conquered all of England to push the Vikings out. So England's unified against the Vikings. The same thing happened in Scotland, where Scotland unified to fight the Vikings. The reason Paris is the capital of France, because France fell into anarchy where local nobility ran everything, is that when the Vikings raided Paris and raided France, the guy who could fight off the Vikings, Hugh Capet, he did such a noble job fighting off the Vikings, all the other nobility in France said, you should be king. And Hugh Capet happened to be the count of the village of Paris. And our Paris was a small town. It wasn't a village. So that accident of history is why Paris is the capital of France. And the, 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 the king in Paris had no power for the Viking period, but he became the technical ruler. And then over uh, a bunch of brilliant leaders in the 1200s, France unified into a country. The reason Germany became the country it did is because, um, is because they had to fight off the Hungarian invaders. And the Duke of Saxony unified France, Germany and Italy because he was the guy who could beat off, <laughs> he could defeat the Hungarians. Spain formed as a country to fight off the Muslims. And so all the countries in Europe formed in this time period to fight off invaders like the Vikings. Fascinating. And, and what do you think people misunderstand or un underappreciate about, about the Vikings? Uh, that's a great question. The so we we, ta we tend to view the Vikings as pure savages with horned helmets. First of all, the horned helmets never happened. That was a later romanticization from the 19th century. And there's a couple different things we, we don't get about them. The first is that they weren't savages. The Vikings were very intelligent. They were very... Um, it wasn't a barbaric society, or it was barbaric in that they killed people and cut their backs open and tortured their enemies and burnt and raped and that stuff. But the Vikings actually had a pretty strong society. They had capitalism. They had an alphabet. They um, had democracy. Um, they had large merchant cities. There were, over the Viking period, due to all the trade going on, Scandinavia developed these giant trading, these large trading cities, and Scandinavia became incredibly wealthy. We'll unearth, um, it's pretty common to unearth giant hordes of silver around Scandinavia. Most cases, silver for, or silver from the Muslim world, because the Vikings were the biggest capitalists of the era. And so they operated a trade that stretched from Central Asia to North America. And so the Vikings were slave, the Vikings in the East were slave traders. And they, they, Russia was the big center of slave trading. And so the word Slav, which is a term for, the peoples of Eastern Europe, like the Russians, the Poles. Slav is a word for slave because so many of the Slavs were traded as slaves to the Muslims that they became completely synonymous. And the Vikings, through slave trading, and they would sell amber, which is like a, it's a pretty jewelry thing. Um, they would sell iron. Um, they became quite wealthy and advanced through this. And Europe in that time period was a developing economy in the same way Africa or South America was. Europe would make raw goods and then send the raw goods to the wealthier societies like Islam or the Eastern Roman Empire. And so Russia formed by the Vikings. The Vikings moved into Russia, or Swedish Vikings, and they basically colonized the tribes of Russia and formed this trading empire to trade at the Muslims and the East Romans. And the Vikings, as I said before, they had a habit where they had to bathe every week. If you didn't bathe once a week as a Viking, you were considered disgusting. And also, most Scandinavians in the society were peaceful. Most people in Scandinavia were just trying to live their lives or farm or cook or have kids. The Vikings were a small warrior elite. And so Viking in a lot of Scandinavia was a derogatory term, where Vikings were young men who would go out, make money and by conquering stuff, return to Scandinavia, and then just party. And they didn't do any work because they made enough money off fighting. And so in Scandinavia, Viking was a derogatory term of basically guys who would just kill people, return, party, sleep with lots of women. They were like cowboys, where the cowboys were known for just being degenerates at home. And the reason the Scandinavian societies today are so peaceful and so communitarian and that stuff, because if you look at the Vikings, they were very individualistic, very aggressive, very... I see a lot of similarities in the Vikings and the Americans, because... The kinds of people who immigrated to America were the same kinds of people who would be Vikings. And over centuries, these Scandinavians filtered out those people because they all left. And so the modern Scandinavians are the descendants of the people who stayed at home. Wow. 
the um that's very interesting. So should we talk more about the the fall um of, of the Viking and then the transition to the to the Middle Ages? Yeah. Or do you think there's still more during the time of their reign that we should I can, get into first? Let me talk about the fall. And so there's several periods of Viking history. The first from 790 until 850 was just raiding, where the Vikings had no interest in settling or conquering areas, and they were raiding monasteries, where Europe at this point was culturally a theocracy. The church did absolutely everything, but none of the monasteries where the monks lived were protected. And so because it was a theocracy, so none of the warring princelings or kings would ever attack a monastery because it was just sacred. The Vikings didn't care. The Vikings were pagans. So for the first 50 years, they would attack monasteries, they'd attack towns. They had no interest in settling. From 850 until 900, the Vikings started colonizing places. The Vikings conquered two-thirds of England with the Great Danish Army. The Vikings colonized a third of Ireland, where uh, Dublin and Limerick, all the major cities in Ireland, are founded by the Vikings. The Vikings settled Iceland. They settled Greenland. They went out to America. And then they conquered all of Eastern Europe. So first phase, attacking monasteries. Second phase, settlement. And the Vikings also conquered the area of northern France called Normandy. And the Normans became one of the most important players in later European history, where the Normans conquered England. They conquered southern Italy. They went on the Crusades. Where these Vikings in the north of France, they became their own incredibly important force, where they were descended from the Vikings. They started speaking French, started having castles, they converted to Christianity, so they were French Vikings. And what happened as the Vikings became more successful was the countries they fought started becoming stronger to fight off the Vikings. It was this recursive thing where the as the Vikings got killed more of the the people, the people started becoming stronger to fight them off. And the problem is there just weren't enough Vikings to deal with it. Where Scandinavia was not a heavily populated area, if the English or the French or the Germans got their crap together, they could beat the Vikings. And that's eventually what happened. So by the time you get to 1000 AD, you have the solidification of these Western European countries into united countries that can fight off the Vikings. And feudalism also shows up. And so the Vikings start to go into a cline over the 1000s. And this is partly due to the unification of Scandinavia into different political forces. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the chaotic process of centralization, which occurred under the Vikings and propelled the Viking Age, finished. So what happens when let's say Norway is a centralized country. If Norway and England are centralized governments, you can't just go from Norway and raid England because first of all, England is now united and can defend itself. And secondly, the English king can send an ambassador to Norway and say, hey, I don't like it that your guys don't like are attacking us. I will give you a trade embargo if you keep doing this. So as government centralized, it meant that it was just, it got too hard to make these battle startups. And um, also, Scandinavia converted to Christianity, which is a huge factor, where the Vikings had a, they had their own pagan religion, and they were the last of the old pagans. And so their religion was based around war, where the god of war was the most powerful god in their religion. And if, for all men who died heroically in battle, they would go to heaven. And so the Viking warrior religion, it's the indigenous religion of the English and the Germans and all Germanic people that the Vikings lost at last. And the Viking religion was great when they were this chaotic warrior society. But as Scandinavia unified, you just couldn't play that anymore. And so what happened is that this is a big thing around 1000 AD. 1000 AD was when a lot of the world became countries. Southeast Asia, West Africa, Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia all became countries and unified places at the same time in 1000 AD. And with these new kingdoms of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the kings needed people to actually run the country. And the only people who could read and write were the church. So they all converted to Christianity as a way to get to get people who can manage their governments. And at the same time, because if everyone's Christian, you can trade with other Christians because there's this shared cultural consensus. And so when Scandinavia became Christian, the idea that was in their head was, we want to be like the rest of Europe. 
because it's economically no longer in our incentive to attack people. So let's trade with them. And also, once your country's unified, you the value system can no longer be about killing people. It has to be about getting along. And so Christianity, a religion that like says you should love everyone, that's much better for a unified society. And so in 1000 AD, you had this final wave of Viking conquests, but these were all centralized governments, not startups. The, Norwe- the English, the Danes inv- invaded England, and the Danes actually owned all of England for 20 years, and our King Canute. And then the Norwegians, the government invaded England, and that nearly worked, but the English beat them at a really close battle. And so in this time period, you could have seen England become a Scandinavian country. But what happened instead was the Normans conquered England, and this is why a third of English vocabulary is French. And so the Vikings died out as centralized governments became too strong. Yep. Fascinating. Is is there, um, why was the conversion to Christianity again? Um, Two reasons. The first was that, it's actually the same reason. It's that as government became more centralized, you could no longer have a religion based around killing people. Where in the old Viking religion, the highest noble thing is um, to die in battle. It's So for the Vikings, the way their heaven worked is that if you were a man, you died in battle, you go to heaven. If you're a woman, you die in pregnancy, you go to heaven. No one else gets to go to heaven. What happens when you're a centralized country where you can't kill people? You need to, to like trade and get along. And so as Scandinavia centralized, they had to move to a religion of cooperation and love. In medieval Christianity, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, the Unitarian Church today. It's not some fluffy mainline church. They, they had pictures of Jesus being a warrior. They had, they'd have wow. images in the church of Jesus carrying swords. So this is like a, a, a more warrior Christianity than what we have today, but it's still more communitarian than um, than what the church beforehand was. Um, it's actually interesting because we have records of the conversion of the Vikings, and it's really funny in a couple ways, where you have these, these English or German priests trying to convert the Vikings, and they have like a one-half shot of getting their head cut off. And this is such a religious society, even with a 50% death rate, there are all these monks keep going to the Vikings to convert them. And they often converted the Vikings because the Vikings were impressed at how much balls these priests had, where they challenge <laughs> these priests to religious battles where they're like, okay, if you can prove your God is better than our God, we will have a battle of magic. And whoever has the most impressive magic we convert to, or hey, I have a battle. If you can get your God to win this battle, I will convert. Or if you as a priest can walk on a walk through a fire without dying, your God is real. So like a game show where I will convert to your religion if you can do this weird thing. And they tried to translate the Bible into the Viking language and the results are hilarious where it reads like an action movie (laughs) where because they don't have language. And so all these things like... um, and so, like, they have to translate the Bible into this warrior text, like, and so they'll do all these things, like, they they use honor as a value system in Christianity a lot, or they they turn, they wrote Yahweh, or the God of the Bible, as this incredible battle god, who, if you worshipped him, he would give you victory in battle. And it's, I, I read one of the translations that they wrote for the Vikings, uh, for the Bible, and, it, and it's similar to when they can when they when they converted the Inuit to Christianity, instead of saying the Lamb of God, they said the Seal of God, because the Seal is the closest animal in Inuit culture that you can convey a lamb to in Christianity. Yeah, fa- fascinating. And the um, going back for a second, do you think there's anything that the Vikings could have done? Like, imagine alternative history here. Uh, where yeah. the Vikings ruled for a bit longer or weren't defeated in this way, like it didn't implode in this way. Say, say more about what that could have been like. So there are a couple hinge points where the Vikings could have gotten a lot bigger, where they lost. There were two points where the Vikings nearly conquered England. The first was um, in the 800s, when they conquered two-thirds of England, had to conquer the final third. But the English king who was fighting them, who owned the South English Kingdom of Wessex, he is possibly the best king in English history. So the English just rolled really luckily and got their best ruler ever, 
right when the Vikings were to destroy them. And so Alfred the Great beat back the Vikings and then installed the modern English state. And the Vikings could have won that, took it, taken over England. The second thing is the Vikings conquered England. And there's a great TV show, one of my favorite TV shows called the Vinland Saga, which is about this topic, where the Vikings briefly conquered England for 20 years. But due to complications with uh, with succession, they they lost it back to the English. But for either of... And then the Vikings, there was a third time they nearly conquered England, which was under Harold Hadrada, who I don't have time to get into him. He is one of the most incredible men in history. This dude was like wow. the greatest Chad ever. Um, and he nearly conquered England. So there are these multiple hinge points where the Vikings very nearly completely changed the trajectory of what would become one of the most important countries in, in history. So if the Vikings won this, the English language would be like Dutch or Danish. The culture of England would be completely different. England would be a Scandinavian country, and we're currently in an English diaspora country. So the entire English-speaking world's culture would have gone in a completely different direction if that had happened. And a topic I also want to get into is I'm surprised we even talked to the Vikings in North America. The Vikings very briefly had a colony in Vinland, and this is a, a weird thing. The only place in North America that corresponds geographically to the Viking descriptions of the place they settled called Vinland is New York City. You read the Vinland saga of the place they settled, it's exactly New York City. It's this giant river, island at the mouth of the river, then a longer island further out. And that sounds like I'm making it up, but if you look at the American East Coast, New York City is the best port region, and the Vikings always looked for ports where they would the Vikings always held the mouth of rivers because they were a seafaring people. And so we do have records that show that the Vikings probably had a colony in New York City. And we have some kind of bad records that the Vikings reached Mexico, where we have Stelae that the Mayans wrote talking about a people and they drew ships like Viking longships and they talk about pale skinned people um with blue eyes. And so there's, we have some evidence that the Vikings reached Mexico. And with all of that, and that theory is, I, I was talking to a, a, a guy who's an expert in Mesoamerica, and he doesn't believe that. So um, take that with a grain of salt. The Vikings could have had a bigger impact on North America, but it was basically just a historical blip that went nowhere. Wow. The... Um... Okay, maybe gearing towards r wrapping up here, like say yeah. more about you know the the true Yolo, like what what uh, impressed you about the the Yolo nature of the Vikings, or what we think their their legacy yeah. should 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 be in terms of why they're so impressive, or, was, or what they inspired. I was going to tell you about that anyway. And that was the thing where the thing that impresses me the most of the Vikings is how far they went. It's just it's insane. So Vikings, as I said before. They went out to New York City. They went out to the American East Coast. That's really far from Europe. We have records yeah. they reached close to the North Pole in Canada, where they sailed wow. up. The Vikings had a colony in Greenland. The weather then was warmer. And so um, they reached close to the North Pole. The Vikings went out to Central Asia. We have statues and goods from India and China that we've found in Sweden. And we have records of the Vikings going out to Uzbekistan or Iran. The Vikings, they sailed around Spain into the Mediterranean. They raided Italy. Um, Harold Hadrada, the Chad I talked about before, he was fighting in Israel. He was fighting in Italy. He was fighting in Armenia. And then there were Vikings who sailed down the coast of Africa who reached the Canary Islands. The Vikings rediscovered the Canary Islands off the west coast of Africa, which is absurd. The Vikings discovered it, not the Muslims who were 100, 200 miles away. And the Vikings even, they met black people and called them blue men. And so the thing I find most impressive at the Vikings is just how far they got. They went all the way from Central Asia to North America. And it's all starting in Scandinavia. Uh, wow, that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's pretty insane. The, um, is there anything we haven't yet covered about the, the Vikings or that, that time period that you think uh, listeners uh, need, need to know? I'd go through a little bit more of the states, um, the states the Vikings made. Actually, I'm going to focus more so on the east, where possibly the biggest thing the Russians did is they founded Russia, where 
the word Russia comes from Rus, where Rus was the local Slavic word for rower. And so Rosia means land of the Rus or the rowers. And the Vikings colonized all of Ukraine. They colonized Ukraine, Belarus, Western Russia, and created the Russian state. And so Russia started out as a colony of the Vikings. And then over time, the native Slavic population, the Vikings interbred with them. And then the Slavs took over Russia. And the Vikings were in the Eastern Greek, um, Eastern Roman Empire, in Greece and Turkey, the Byzantines, their elite guard were Vikings. So they would get Viking soldiers to basically be the shock troops. Where it's crazy to imagine a regime in the Middle East using Vikings as their top soldiers. And the Vikings did a lot of trade with Islam and the the the, the Greek Empire. And the thing that I find that's really impressive about them is just how far their influence went in places that are just completely distant from Scandinavia. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, it, it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty insane. So maybe, maybe again, again, wrap, wrapping this up, say, say more about the transition to the, to the middle ages and, yeah. um, what were some of the big changes and, uh, give a little bit of preview. I'm sure we'll cover that a time sure. at some point of what, what was to come. Um, this is my favorite era of history, so we're definitely going to have more episodes of the Middle Ages. The The Vikings end right as the Crusades start, and I think that's the best way to look at it, where a lot of the Crusaders were former Vikings. The Normans are a great example, where the Normans were descendants of Vikings, um, and they moved to northern France, converted to Christianity, then they went on the Crusades. So it's the same people who are sailing to America and Russia. They're like, we're Christian now, let's attack Israel which is insane. Like I look at the Crusades and it just blows my mind where you can talk about maybe it was immoral and like, that's not real Christianity, whatever. But the fact that people just ran, this is a primitive non-urban society just said, yeah, let's randomly walk 2000 miles to Israel to attack it. And so the Middle Ages is the origin of modern Western civilization. Where for the 1,000 years from 1,000 to 2,000, every century Western civilization got more advanced. And this is the thing that's most impressive about Western civilization, that most civilizations go through cycles of Dark Age, Empire, Decadence, Dark Age. The West just went up for 1,000 years. And with that, you saw the rise of the modern West we live in. So with the Middle Ages and the unification of these governments, with the rise of Christianity taking over the world, you saw the creation, as I said before, of the modern value system we have. You saw the creation of the stock market, the university system, um, par parliaments became standardized across Europe, um, modern capitalism, um, our polit all of the names for the military come from this time period. So with this transition, the Vikings became some of the most important people in the medieval Europe through converting to Christianity, and their descendants helped build the Western civilization that's still the same society as it was a thousand years ago. And so the Vikings first, the Vikings in their own twisted way, really helped Western civilization by, first of all, beating them up so hard that the West had to become stronger to fight them, and then being incorporated into Christianity and then pushing it further. And I think that's the best way to transition from the Dark Ages to the Middle Ages. Yeah, that's a good overview. So with, with that in mind, let, in order to wrap, let, let's actually give a preview of, of what, to, what to expect in some, some upcoming episodes. So sure thing. for example, well, the... before, we get, um, before we wrap sure. up, let me, get, and I'm going to put this in the YouTube video, is the three books that I'd recommend you read more on this topic, and they're all called The Vikings. Um, there's a book all the, about the Vikings by Gwyn Jones, there's one by Robert Ferguson, and there's one by Neil Oliver. And I'm sorry, everyone, our next video is not going to be at the Middle Ages. Um, <laughs> for our next topic, I need to talk to Eric about it. I believe it's either colonial America or the fall of the Roman Republic. Yeah. 
And um, let's just give a preview of, of some some upcoming topics uh, just in general that we want to cover. And also, if, if audience has uh, recommendations, they could write it in the in the comments. So, yeah, you mentioned the Roman Republic, early America. We want to do the American Civil War, but also yeah. go for it. Our goal is to gradually cover as many historical topics as we can. And so my goal here is that a normal person can watch, watch through these videos every week. And by whatever number, he will know a good amount about each historical topic that he can bring up in a coffee shop um, or in a, a cocktail party or write a maybe write a fantasy novel based off that era or pass a historical yeah. test. And so there's... Hopefully you guys keep watching in each episode. I can promise it'll be interesting where we'll rope in another historical period. And the thing that I believe is the world we, we live in is crazier than game of Thrones or uh, Lord of the Rings. And the more you look at the past and the drama of what occurred, then the more you will look, take in and admire how beautiful life is. Yeah. No, and, and we'll go as, as back from, you know, the, Topics like the ancient China, the fall of Rome, yeah. you know, medieval Islam, foundation of yeah. world religions, classical Greece, but then also to, you know, World War II and communism and sort of, uh, you know, more modern day topics as well. Definitely. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, until until next week, this was a, this is a great deep dive on the Vikings. Yes, of course. Oh, sir.